time. You may get brain damage. You may forget everything. But this heart is protected. You will not hear of many incidents at all where someone's had a car crash and the heart is broken, or the heart is damaged, or the heart has got squashed. So the heart of Allah's house is protected. So this is in the physical sense. But in the spiritual sense, we came to this conclusion. When Imam Sadiq says that in Hussein, this is a guarded mahabbat that Allah has placed in their hearts. Tonight I'm going to touch upon this subject a little bit more. Then we talked about the ayah that says that the Kaaba is Hudan lil Alameen. And we said that how can the house that is made of brick and mortar guide people? Then we correlated with the heart in the human body and we said that the heart of the Prophet was the place of Nuzul of Quran and Rasulullah is Hudan lil Alameen. Therefore, the heart of Rasulullah is the Quran and he is the guide to mankind. We talked about Ayat al Bayyinat. We said that inside the house, in the physical aspects, was the Biladat of Amir al Mu'mineen. That was Allah's biggest ayah, was born in that house. And in our hearts is the ayahs of Allah, the eyes of the Quran, and Ahlul Bayt. Then we came to this point that Allah says, That whoever gets to Maqam of Ibrahim and enters into their hearts the reliance of Amir al Mu'mineen is safe from the fires of hell. What is Maqam of Ibrahim? One of the things, and I think a lot of you thought this year you may have escaped this, but this is my tradition. I have to every year talk about Namaz. It's part of my, my art, artillery, if you like. And I know a lot of people don't like me talking about Namaz, but we have to. This is the last night. I didn't let you escape from this. Um, Maqam of Ibrahim, the word Maqam comes from the same words, the same family of words as Mu'im and Qa'im. When we say Maqam of Ibrahim, we have to look at what Maqam is this. Rabbi Janni, this is after he built the house. Abbal Bayt, after he built it, he said this dua. Rabbi Janni Mu'im as-salat wa min zurriyyati. Rabbana fataqabbal dua. So he said, I want to be the person who establishes namaz. Then we said whatever qualities, and there's lots of qualities that Ibrahim has, and they're all mentioned in the Quran, Imam Hussein was the inheritor of these qualities. Because in Ziyarat al Varisa, we recite what? Assalamu alayka ya Varisa Ibrahim Khalil Allah. So therefore, the maqam of Ibrahim is Imam Hussein. What else do we say about Imam Hussein? Ashhadu annaka qad aqamta as salat. You are the one who established prayer. Quran says Ibrahim asked to be the one who established prayer. What does this mean? That means that at the point at Karbala when Imam Hussein got there and he created and they brought this war onto him and he fought for the re-establishment of Namaz. That had Hussein ibn and Ali not gone to Karbala and not been killed, then Namaz would have been destroyed. This is why a grand alim once said to me that after you have done Azam, and you have done the ilama, and you're just about to put the hands towards your ears, and just before you say takbir, takbir, just before you say Allahu Akbar, say this, sallallahu alayki ya, ya Abu Abdullah, sallallahu alayki ya Abu Abdullah, sallallahu alayki ya Abu Abdullah, then straight away say Allahu Akbar. When I asked why, he said, because if it wasn't for Hussein, there would be no namaz. And this is a very interesting point. When we finish namaz, we give one more salam without realizing it. Who do we give this salam to? First person, Rasulullah. Yes? There is one more. When you go to the ziyarat of Abu al-Fazl al-Abbas, what is it that you recite? As-salamu alaykum. Ayyuhal Abdu Sadeh al muti When we do namaz, when we finish after saying salam to Rasulullah, what do we say? Assalamu alayna to ourselves. Wa ala ibadillah salihin. Who is the head of the salihin? Abu al Fazl al Abbas. Abdu Sadeh. So start your namaz with Hussein, finish your namaz with Abbas. 
This is the namaz that is Husseini namaz. This is the namaz that Ahlul Bayt like. So Maqam Ibrahim. We said that Maqam Ibrahim, when it comes into your heart, with the love of Ahlul Bayt, with the love of Imam Hussein, this heart is immune from the fires of hell. Just to confirm this from another hadith, Rasulullah says, لو اجتمعت الناس على حب علي ابن أبي طالب لما خلقت النار. Allah says this to Rasulullah. That if all of humanity came together, put their hands together, put their hearts together, and had the love of Amir al-Mu'mini, I would not have even created the fire. Ya Ali. Ayah the Quran that confirms this is Yawm la yanfa'u mal wala banun illa man ata Allahu bi qalbin salim Qalb salim What do we say in the other Quran? Qalbi li qalbikum salim Qalb salim See everything comes together This is why I've said to you whenever you hear a hadith find the ayah of Quran that matches with it then you know this hadith is right then you look at the du'as, look at the ziyaras, look at what Ahlul Bayt do, you see that everything they have got is from the Quran. Last night, and I've had a few people already message me about this, that when I mentioned that the sins leave their mark on the heart, and again, we correlated the heart with Hajar al-Aswad, which is the heart of the Kaaba. This black stone, like I said, was white when it was sent down from heaven. It was white. Amin al muminin says everybody who came and touched this stone and was a sinner turned it black. Imam Sadr says it's the same with the heart. The heart is white, it's pure because it's the light of Allah. Allah is light. So therefore his house is going to be light. Therefore it's going to be white. Every time you sin, a black dot comes on there. So the same as that white stone turns black, your heart will turn black if you carry on sinning. And this is the amazing thing. Kaaba has been destroyed many times by people from outside. This Kaaba in your heart, only you can destroy it. <coughs> only you can destroy it. Because whatever you do, good or bad, will affect your heart. So you are in charge of this Kaaba. And we said last night that one of the biggest sins any human being can do is to upset or hurt or do anything to another mu'min. And we mentioned that the sins leave their mark. We mentioned about Imam Mujtaba's elder son that one, because of his maybe envy towards Imam Sajjad, it left the mark on him. He missed out on being one of the shuhada'i Karbala. And this is why people always come up to him. One of the questions that regularly gets asked is this. Why do we have so many problems in our lives? Why doesn't Allah give our answer to our du'as? Why not? And I say, look within your heart. That's where the problem is. Amir al Umini says, any time you have difficulty in your life, do istighfar, do tawbah. Any difficulty. He doesn't mention what difficulty. He says, any difficulties you have, do istighfar. Repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My, my teacher says this. He says, first, we should do istighfar for our ibadat. Just like Brother Shabir just said now, we have to apologize, we have to do istighfar. Although I just want to make one point to Brother Shabir here, and this is this, that from us, Ahl al-Bayt have only asked for the very minimum, which is the tears. That's all they've asked from us. Anything you do on top is your love. Is the value of your love. You're showing your love if you express it more. But all they wanted from us was the tears. Like I said, when Imam Hussein was born, Bibi Park, her, her concern was this. Who is going to cry for my Hussein? There was no other concern. Who is going to cry for my Hussein? When Imam Reza says to the son of Shabib, in kuntubakiyan ala shay'in fa'abki lil Hussein. <laughs> if you have any difficulties in your life, you feel like crying. And again, my brothers and sisters, there's no shame in crying. If you have any difficulties, even if you've got a headache and you feel like crying, Imam Reza says, remember Hussein and then cry. Why? Because you are making Hussein a partner in your life, a partner in your tears. Where do tears come from? It's a direct breaking of the heart. There's, there is a, I'm not a doctor, but there is something in the heart. There's a valve. As soon as you feel like crying, it releases the tears. 
Yes? So it all goes back to this heart of yours. We said last night, you have to guard this heart from shaitan. Because as soon as you leave any void in your heart from Allah and an Ahlul Bayt, the enemies of Ahlul Bayt come into your heart and so does shaitan. And he doesn't like us at all. We're his biggest enemies. The biggest enemies of shaitan is us shaitans. He tries his best to take Imam Hussein away from us. This is why one of the du'as that has been taught to us that we have to recite in the time of the Qaybah of Imam Zaman is this du'a. Ya Allah, Ya Rahman, Ya Rahim, Ya Muqallib al-Qulub, Sabbit Qulubana ala Deenik. See, it all correlates and connects with each other. So my brothers and sisters, every other part of your body connects to this heart. Your eyes, your tongue. Now the tongue is the most difficult. The tongue is the most difficult. And you may say that we forgive, we ask Allah for forgiveness, but how can you recompense? And I'm just going to give you one very quick example as how the lie from your tongue can come out and how do you recompense it by Toba? You can't. A very famous British Prime Minister, I don't want to mention his name because I don't like mentioning these names in the member because these names are Najis, right? These names are Najis, we mention them in the member, it makes the member dirty, it also dirties our heart. Which is why I also don't like mention the names of the enemies of Ahlul Bayt, because they are also Najis. In fact, they are the biggest Najasat in the world. The same way as you can't take Najasat into Masjid al Haram, any bodily fluids or anything like that can't go to Masjid al Haram, you can't also enter Najasat in this heart, because this is Bayt of Allah. This is why I said to you, look at your value. You have got Masjid al Haram and Kaaba in yourself. Yet, how easily do we pollute this heart? But this British Prime Minister told one lie. What was that? A certain Iraqi president has weapons of mass destruction. Within 45 minutes he can use it. So what do we do? Let's invade him and get rid of him. One lie. And he has admitted to this. He said he was a lie. What did he do? He went to Toba? Oh Allah, forgive me. I said one lie. How many millions of people have been killed because of that one lie? How do you do Toba for that? Amir al muminin says, words in your tongue are like an arrow. Once it's been released, you can't get it back. So stop and think before you use this tongue. How do you do Toba of that? You can't. There is no Toba for that. Again, other parts, if you don't guard them, there is no toba from them. And one of the most, honestly, heartbreaking things we recite in the ziyarat of Imam Hussein is this one. فَلَعَنَ اللَّهُ أُمَّةً سَمَعَتْ بِذَلِكَ فَرَزِيَتْ بِهِ May the curse of Allah be on those people who heard what happened. See, yeah, it's connected to them. Heard what happened to Hussein and they didn't do anything about it. They did not express any indifference to says, Imam Ma'asum says, may the curse of God be in this. What does this mean? That means you are in the same maqam of the killers of Imam Hussain. It's very important that we guard. And because tonight is the night of the shahadat of Imam Hassan al-Askari, I just want to say one hadith from him. And I want to move on to a story that I've been requested to repeat this story because I've said it a few years ago, but I've had a few requests. Imam Askari says this, imagine a room full of the worst qualities a human being can have. He says this, he says, imagine a room. In this room is filled with the worst qualities a human being can have. He then says the key to open the door to this room is the lie. It's a lie. One lie opens the door to all the bad qualities a human being has. One lie of yours, this is why they say things like lying, backbiting, are one of the biggest sins. Because say for instance, someone comes to you, they want to marry their daughter to a certain boy. And they come to you and they say, what do you have? Do you have any opinion about this boy? I've been told you know his family really well. And I, yeah, he's a very good boy. However, if I had a daughter, I wouldn't give it to her. Based on what? 
Or one of the worst other things that Imam Sadr says is in Hadith, he says tuhmat. What is the tuhmat? Tuhmat means slander. Imam Sadr says one tuhmat, one, one, one tuhmat in the day of judgment, its value, its weight is of all of the mountains on earth. One tuhmat. And sometimes we say this tuhmat as a joke. It's become, it's become one of the things, you know, now, as a joke we said this. And actually someone did this to me this year, in, in Ashura did this to me. And he, he, he didn't mean it, and it was to myself, and I forgive him straight away for doing this. But those of you who have been to Tooting, because I usually go to Tooting on Ashura, go to Tooting, at the top of the road, before you get to the Tooting opposite, on the other side of the road, there's a pub on the corner. I had to go in there because I had to use the public facilities in there. As I came out, one of the Mu'minin saw me. <laughs> And he said, and I don't like this title, but he said to me, well, I'm not on the day of Ashura in a pub. <laughs> I said, I was doing Hidayat in there for people. I was guiding them. I said, come and join us. This, is my, this was my response to them. That I was, I was cleansing people for Jerusalem. I was saying to them, they're giving free food and drink. Don't, don't sit in here. No, but see, all joking aside, this is very serious. I remember we even had one person that used to come to one of the mosques here in mean, Istanbul Mosque. They came once and said, look, there's a person here in the Stanmore Mosque. Every time I sit next to him in prayers, I can smell alcohol on his breath. And that guy who they said his, alcohol, his breath of alcohol, he had a role in the community. He was quite high up. So they said, we have to get him out of this community and kick him out of this mosque. What he didn't realize, this guy was a dentist. Every time before he used to come for Jummah, he used to get the mouthwash, which is, has strong, strong alcoholic content in it. He used to rinse his mouth with it and come out and come there. But you see, this one tuhmah, this is why Quran says, you know, kaseeran min azzan. Run away from these thoughts, bad thoughts in your mind about mu'mineen. Because this is what I've said to you. Everybody that is sat here tonight is a mu'min. Wallah al-Azim is a mu'min. According to Amir al-Mu'mineen. Either Amir al-Mu'mineen is lying, or this hadith is a lie. So if you slander one another, you have slandered the mu'min. What does this mean? And I'm going to tell you exactly what this means. This means you have taken an axe, you have taken a bomb, you have taken a weapon, you have taken a grenade, and you have shot it directly at the house of Kaaba. That's what that means. You have taken an axe and you have destroyed the shrine of Imam Hussein. That is what that means. Imam Hussein says, my shrine is in your heart. Therefore, if you talk bad about a fellow mu'min, you have destroyed the shrine of Imam Hussein. This is the reality. That story I promised, and it's all related. There was a young lad in Iran and he used to work as a carpet trader, the Persian rugs, very valuable items. And he started there with someone in the bazaar in Tehran and he became an apprentice and he worked his way up. When he reached about the age of 23, 24, his boss said to him, you have really done well. You're one of our best salesmen. To reward you, I am setting up a shop in Russia and I want you to go there and work there and run the whole shop yourself. Would you accept it? He says, I have to ask my parents. Look at this. And this is a message as well. So he went and asked his parents. The parents said, what a, what a fantastic opportunity for you to go and see another country and learn another language. So he went. He went to Russia, in their marketplace somewhere. They set up a shop. And he took control of this shop. Now, eyes connected to your heart. One day he was walking past this marketplace, he walked past a shop, and I think it was a baker's. He saw a young Russian girl working in that shop. And all it takes is just one look. One look. He looked at her, he fell in love. This is what Shaitan says. The Shaitan says, I hit the arrow, and it goes straight into your heart. There is another hadith about this, but I'm not going to mention it, but that one is terrifying. <coughs> terrifying hadith. Honestly, it terrifies me when I even think about it. And I wish sometimes this hadith is not true, but it is. But I'm not going to mention it. 
So he looked, he fell in love. When you fall in those sort of loves, because it's a shaitani feeling, you become majnoon, you become a bit crazy. You can't sleep. Yeah? Well, see the youngsters nodding their heads. <laughs> and the old men are thinking, I remember what I used to be like. No. But you don't. You can't sleep, you can't eat, everything is taken away from you, you don't have any peace, any tranquility. Yeah? So, he became sick, he wouldn't turn up for work, the shop was shut. The boss got in touch. What's happening? His parents started calling him. So eventually he had to confess. And he said, I have fallen in love with this Russian girl and I want to marry her. And that's all I want from life. So what do we do? What do we do? He found another Iranian guy that he was working with as a translator. Went to the shop to the girl and said, I'm in love with you and I want to marry you. I need to come speak to your parents. She said, it's impossible. Why? Let's try. There's nothing impossible. So anyway, went to the parents' house with the help of a translator. I want to marry your daughter. They said, where are you from? He said, I'm from Iran. They said, are you a Muslim? He said, yes. We don't give our daughter to a Muslim. We are Orthodox Christians, Russian Orthodox Christians. No way on hell we're going to give you our daughter. This is our only daughter. And she had about four brothers as well. I mean, this guy, I mean, what could you have picked, you know? But anyway, so, no, the answer was no. And for someone who's in love, the worst answer is no. So he got even more crazy. He wouldn't eat. He was going, and this, this, this. So eventually he decided this, that this is the only one I want. The heart has now gone crazy. So he went back to the house and said, what is it that you want me to do to prove my love for your daughter? They said, it's very simple. Become a Russian Orthodox Christian. Allah Akbar. Guard this heart of yours, my brothers and sisters. Easily can be stolen. Easily. So he said, no problems. What do I have to do? Come to our church. So he went to the church. The priest came and he said, I heard you want to become a Christian. He says, yes. He said, where are you from? He said, I'm from Iran. He says, what's your religion? He says, I am Muslim. He said, no, you are Shia Muslims. So he said, yes. He goes, okay, your one is a bit more difficult. It's not as simple as saying, I believe in Jesus Christ in the name of the Father, the Ghost, the Holy Spirit, and whatever else they do. You know, simple. You also have to denounce Ahl al-Bayt. You see, the, our enemies know these things about us. He said, I have to hear you verbally denounce Ahlubet. So say, following me after me, I do not believe in Rasulullah. He said, I do not believe in us. I do not believe in Amir al I do not believe in Ahlubet. I do not believe in Fatima Taza. I do not believe. I do not believe in Hassan. I do not believe in Hussein. He said, when I got to this name, I started to tremble a little bit. I got scared. But I said, I've come this way now, what the hell, let's go all the way. So he said, once I started naming these names one by one by one, until I got to Imam Zaman, he says, I could see that from my heart they were walking out. I could see all 14 walking out of my heart. But this love of Hussein is Maknuna, it's guarded. He doesn't want to leave our hearts. He doesn't want to. He even did this to Shem, right at the last moment when he brought the sword out. And I say put it here, but he didn't put it here, he put it here. He took his hand, and Shem thought Hussein was going to plead with him. Oh, don't kill me, please don't kill me, spare my life. No, he said, Shem, come, I'll take you to heaven with me. I will take you to my father, Ali. This is when, this is after he has killed Abbas, Akbar, Ali, and Al Yet Imam Hussein doesn't want to let them go. This is your mola. So anyway, they got married. They started living together. And approximately after six months, he says, I was sat there. One morning, we got up for breakfast. And my wife walked into the kitchen. I was sat at a table. She looked at me and she said, you seem a bit strange today. What is wrong with you? He said, I don't know why, but ever since I've woken up this morning, there's a very strange feeling in my heart. 
I feel very heavy. I feel like I'm depressed. I feel, and she said, you know what? I'm exactly the same. Maybe we ate something last night. Maybe we drank something that has caused this feeling. So they started one by one ruling out what it could be. Did you have this medicine? No, did you do this? Maybe it was so cold outside you went without a hat on. All these sort of things, one by one. They said. Then they said, look, we can't figure it out. But the wife said, look, I have extreme pain in my heart. And he said, I'm exactly the same. It's like as if I want to start crying uncontrollably. I don't know what. So he said, do me one more favor. So they said, go and bring my diary. So he brought, they brought the diary, she opened it in front of him, he started going through the page, but what date is it today? In the, in the Gregorian calendar, what is it? He said, I don't know, it's the 23rd or whatever, March 19, whatever. So he opened the page, when he opened it, because it was a Farsi Iranian diary, he opened it to the page, the day that it was, it was written next to it, Yom Mula Ashura. Yom Mula Ashura. He started to cry. He started to cry. He started hitting himself in the head and the face. She said, why are you crying? He said, I can't explain to you why I'm crying. She said, no, no, tell me. I won't leave you alone until you tell me why you're crying. He said, today is the day of Ashura. She said, what does that mean? He said, we have a Hussein. He went to Karbala. He took his wife and his children and his aunt and his sister. They all went to Karbala. There, there were thirsty and 30,000 people came, they killed him. He started reciting the Masa'ib of Hussein for this Christian wife of his. She started to cry uncontrollably. So she said, after hearing this, I want you to do a favor for me. What's that? She said, I want to become a lover of this Hussein. I want to become a Muslim. So he said, what do we do? He said, when my family find out, if my brothers find out, they will kill me. So he said, okay, we'll keep it hidden then. So we denounce Christianity. Let's go back to Hussein. Mahabbat al maknuna This Mahabbat is guarded. <laughs> so they became Muslim just amongst themselves. Another six months went past. This girl that he'd fallen in love with, and he said, one of the reasons I fell in love with she had very beautiful eyes. This girl developed an illness. I think it was cancer that eventually robbed her of her eyesight and she became so ill that within one year of their marriage, she died. Look at he was prepared to leave everything just for one year of marriage. She died, but before she died, she said to her husband, I am not getting better, it's a terminal illness. However, I have one request from you and I want you to carry this out for me. He said, what is it? He goes, when I die, I want to be buried at Karbala. <laughs> Allahu Akbar, this boy's, this guy's difficulties have now become one million. Uh, first of all, how is he going to tell the family that this girl that's died wants to be buried at Karbala? They don't even know they're Muslims. He's in a foreign land. What can he do? So he said she died. She passed away. They took her to the church. They did their traditions. And in the Russian Orthodox tradition, they bury your possessions with you in the grave. So they brought all her gold, all her jewelry, and they buried it with her in the grave. So he thought to himself, what I'm going to do is let them bury her. What happens at night time, I'm going to come to the grave. I will dig it out myself. I will take her body out. I will take all her gold and all her jewelry with me as well. And I will put it on the back of a car and we'll drive to Karbala. So he came, he waited till midnight, everyone had gone. He brought the shovel and he pulled out the coffin. He opened the coffin, he looked inside the coffin, there was a man, very dark faced, big ugly man, in her coffin. He thought, oh my God, I've dug up the wrong grave. Then he looked, all her jewels and all her possessions were in the same coffin, so he goes, no. This is the right thing. What have I done? You know, he's too scared. It's scary, isn't it? Midnight, you go to the graveyard, you open it up and you expect your wife to be in there, but there's a big, scary looking man in there instead. So he got scared. So he collected all her jewels, all her gold, all her possessions, put it in a bag and he got into his car and he drove straight to Iran. When he got to Iran, he went to Qom. He went to the house of Ayatollah bin Mahani. Rahmatullah alayhi. When he got to the house of Ayatollah bin Mahani, as soon as he opened the door, the Khadim of Allah came and said, what is it that you want? 
He said, I need to see Ayatollah Behbani. He said, why? He said, because I have got some hopes for him. I've got some dirty money possession that I want him to clean for us. So when he went to the room, Ayatollah said to him, sit down. And Ayatollah said to him, I know what you have come for. He said, give me the money, give me the gold, give me the jewelry. He said, now I want you to, you're going to ask who was that man in her grave. He said, how do I know what happened? He said, because just before you came into the house, I had a phone call from Karbala. They say that there was a man who died in Karbala a few days ago. This man was a money shark. He was a money lender, loan shark, yes? He used to go around taking money from people, charging interest, making their lives a misery. Which is again, one of the biggest sins there is in Islam. But because he had bought a plot at Karbala and had been asked to be buried there, they had buried them. But when the people at Karbala found out that this dirty Najis person has been buried in the shrine of Imam Hussein, they started demonstrating. They went to the house of one of the Maraja Tablid in Karbala and said, we want this body out of the shrine of Imam Hussein. We don't care. If you have to open up the grave. They said they went to the shrine of Imam Hussein. They opened up the grave. They looked down. There was a young Russian girl buried in that grave. You give your heart to Hussein, he will do everything for you, everything for you. If he does that with Shem, how is he going to leave us on the day of judgment? Again, one of my traditions is, every year I have to say this, it's about the ziyarat of Imam Hussein. I always, every year, give you one hadith about the ziyarat of Imam Hussein. And on this last hadith, I will finish up, inshallah. Imam Sadr says, Man zara hus qabr al Hussein fi Karbala ka man zara Allahu fi arshin. There's a very delicate point in this hadith. Imam Sadr says, whoever does what? Ziyarat of Hussein at Karbala? No, whoever does ziyarat of the grave of Hussein, Qabr al Hussein fi Karbala. Kamanzar Allah is as if they have done the ziyarat of Allah on this earth. One of the ulama of Husseini, one of the ulama of Husseini, I was reading this in his biography, that he would spend six months of the year at Karbala. He would spend the rest of the six months of the year either in Qom or Mashhad or Raza. May Allah give us the ziyarat of all those places. It is written in his memoirs that whenever, and now look at the connection with these people, whenever he would want to go to the ziyarat, and now these are teaching us, whenever he wanted to go to the ziyarat, this is what he would do. He would go to the hotel, he would have a shower, he would do a ghusl, he would wear clean clothes, he would put on the atom, make smell good, then he would start reciting the tasbih and tells the zahra, alayhi wa salam, 33 times, Allahu Akbar, la ilaha illa alhamdulillah, and then, he would go towards the shrine of whoever it was he was visiting. So if he was at Karbala, he would go to the shrine of Abul Fazl Abbas first. And this is another lesson, that whoever goes to Karbala should always go to the grave of Abul Fazl Abbas first. The same way that Lady Zainab did on Arbaeen. She first went to the grave of Abbas, then she went to the grave of Hussein. Why? Because Abbas is Babul Hussein. Okay? So... He would go to that grave, he would go to the door of the shrine, and as you all know, you have to recite Izna Dukhul. Izna Lava, Izna Rasul, Izna Amir al Mu'minin. Then he asked permission to enter the shrine. But he would not enter. He would turn back, go to the hotel, have his dinner, he would go to sleep, he would wait for the person whose ever grave it was to come to his dream and say, I give you personal permission to enter my shrine. If they didn't give him permission, he wouldn't go to Ziyarat. Look at how these people did Ziyarat. Now he says this in his memoirs. And now we're going to go back right to the beginning of these two months and eight days. We're going to go right back to the beginning. And this links into what brother Shabiti Johnny said at the beginning of his recitation. He says, 
that one couple of days before Muharram, one year, he was feeling a bit ill. He was feeling a bit weak. In his heart, he felt a bit empty. One night before the majority was to start for Muharram, he went to sleep. In his sleep, he saw Imam Hussein. Imam Hussein as what? How did he see Imam Hussein? In the same state that Imam Hussein was lying on the sand of Karbala, Oriana. What does this mean? Imam Hussein didn't have clothes on Oriana. They killed Imam Hussein while he was without a top on. So he looked at the body of Imam Hussein. And he said to Imam Hussein, Imam Hussein, you are covered in cuts, in wounds. Till now, you still haven't healed? So he said, Oh Alim, get up. Tomorrow is the first of Muharram. Go and tell all the Shi'ayan to cry for me. What will happen when we cry for you, Hussein? Your tears will heal my wounds. So he did. He got up, he went, told his people in his majlis, this is what I saw last night. So they all started to cry for him, as you would do. Tenth of Muharram went by, Shama Gariba went by, he saw Imam Hussein in his sleep again, in the same state, but this time, Alhamdulillah, the body had healed. So he said to Imam Hussein, Alhamdulillah, I see your body is healed. He said, yes, you Mu'mineen, really this year, you cried really well for me. Your tears healed my body. Then he said, Mawla, however, there is still two wounds on your body. One was on his chest, it was still bleeding, and there was one on his back. And he said, Mawla, didn't we do enough for you? I apologize if we haven't cried enough for you. He said, no, these two wounds will not be healed until the day of judgment. Why, Mawla? Why? Because every wound on my body represents one of the Shuhada of Karbala. This wound on my back is the death of Abbas. This wound will never be healed until the day of judgment. What is this wound on your chest to say? This wound is the death of Akbar. It is on my heart. This will never be healed. Allahu Akbar. Why am I going to Ali and Al Akbar tonight? Why? Because tonight is the last night of crying. But why am I going to Akbar? Because in, in the Kamil of Ziyarat, it is written this. And I had never read this myself until this year. This year for me was heartbreaking. Believe me, I wish Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would take my life right now. So I do not tell you what I read this year. In Kamil of Ziyarat, it says this. That when Shem came to cut off the head of Imam Hussein. Imam Hussein, like I said to you a few nights ago, was very weak. When he got closer, he saw that Hussein ibn Ali was crying. He started doing taunting of Imam Hussein. He said, oh Hussein, you are the son of Haydar al-Karrar. You are the son of Ali ibn Abi Talib. You are crying like a woman? He went closer, he went closer. He heard Hussein saying something under his breath. He said, what is Hussein? Maybe he's pleading with me. He got closer. He heard him on Hussein say, Waladi Ali, Waladi Ali. What does this mean? That means Imam Hussein, into the last moment, he was still crying for Ali and Al Akbar. Like I said last night, Ali and Al Akbar was the first shaheed from Bani Hashem. He had got killed around one o'clock in the afternoon. Yet the six o'clock in the evening, Hussein is still crying for Ali. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. I have never understood in my life how they killed Ali and Al Akbar. I have never understood this. This has always been a problem for me until this year. Alhamdulillah, I found that why. But now I wish I can't live. Now I understand why Imam Hussein said at the body of Ali, Waladi ala dunya ba'dik al -afar. Oh Ali, after your death, this whole world is worthless for me. Why did Hussein say this? How did they kill Ali and Al Akbar? Allah Akbar, first of all, when Ali and Al Akbar got on his horse to go to the battlefield, this is written that this didn't happen for any of the other shahada. All of the women rushed out of the tents. They surrounded Ali and Al Akbar. Everyone is someone is holding on to the stirrup of the horse. One is holding on to the saddle. One is holding the legs of the horse. One is holding on to the dress of Ali. One is holding on to his sword. Everyone is pleading with him. Then they all started saying this to him, Akbar, where are you going? He said, I have to go. They said, Akbar, don't go. Come and take us back to Medina yourself. He said, no, I have to go. Then 
they said this, Oh Akbar, irham gurbatana. Oh Akbar, have mercy on our loneliness. Why did they say our loneliness? Why did Imam Hussein was alive? Well, Abu Fatul Abbas was alive. Why did these women say our loneliness? Have mercy on our loneliness. Allahu Akbar. Imam Hussein had to intervene here. He said to him, Let Akbar go. He belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let him go. So he went. Hazrat Sakina in Kobra says, I was looking at my father the whole time that Akbar went. His eyes were rolling in his sockets, just like someone was about to give life. His breathing had become very heavy. I became fearful for my father's life. I thought he's going to die now. Imam Hussein was sat on his horse watching what these people were doing to Akbar. Every time an arrow would come, Imam would use the power of Imam. He would divert that arrow with his eyes. This is why Ali and Al Akbar made this excuse. And he came back to the tent. He came back to his tent for a couple of reasons. One, he knows that making your father happy is an act of ibadah. Secondly, he he knows that the ziyarat of Hussein is Afzal. Thirdly, he came back to his father and very quietly he said in the ear of his father, Ya Abate, an atashukat katalani. <laughs> oh father, the thirst is killing me. Please let me go. What does that mean? Take your eyes off me. Let them do what they want to do with me. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar, it is written in Kamil of Ziyarat that when he went back into the battlefield, whether it was Harmala or whoever it was, I don't know, he struck an arrow. Munqazat Turris, what does this mean? That means the arrow, look at me, when, what does this mean? The arrow went between the ear and the throat. It went in through here and it went into his bones. He tried his best to take this arrow out. The blood is pouring. He tried to take it out, but he couldn't take the arrow out. So he fell on top of the horse. When he fell on top of the horse, his helmet fell off. When his helmet fell off, they started striking him in his head. They started striking him in his head. Blood went everywhere. He could now not see anything. Allahu Akbar. So he kicked the horse. What does this mean? Take me back to my father and say, take me back to my father and say, Allahu Akbar. Just how like the lady surrounded him, his enemy surrounded his horse. They did not let it go. Instead, they took it back into the battlefield. Allahu Akbar. Imam Hussein was watching this from the mound. He was watching what was happening. Just like you see people doing martyrs, doing this, doing this. He saw the swords going up and coming down. Spears going up and coming down. Allahu Akbar, I never understood why they use this narration for this. They say, What does this mean? I have never understood this. They killed him with the sword. They cut him into pieces with the sword. 40 by 40. What does this mean? I asked an alim, what does 40 by 40 mean? He says, have you ever been to a butcher's when they want to chop up a piece of meat? Have you seen how the butcher does it? He gets the meat cleaver out. He starts putting his hand up like this to cut up the meat. This is Irban Irba. I said, no, this still does not satisfy me. What does Irban Irba mean? He goes, the only way I can translate this for you is this. He went and he got the tasbih out of his pocket. He held it like this, then he ripped it. All the pieces of the tasbih fell on the floor. Then he says, is this Irban Irba? I said, no, I'm still not satisfied. So he took a mirror off the wall and he smashed it onto the ground. You see how the pieces of the glass have scattered? This is Irba Irba. This is what they did to the body of Akbar. They cut him into so many pieces, which is why when Imam Hussein came to his body, he had to take all the bodies back to the tent, but he couldn't pick up all the pieces. This is why he shouted out the Al-Fatiana Bani Hajjim. All the use of Bani Hajjim, come and take the come and take Akbar back to the tent. Allahu Akbar, Hazrat Zainab says this about Imam Hussein at the body of Akbar. She says Imam Hussein was not crying at the body of Akbar, but he was Asar Khatal Hussein ala Jasadir. Imam Hussein was screaming at the body of Akbar. Allahu Akbar. They say to us, why do you cry in such a way? Why do you shout for Imam Hussein? Why do you scream for Imam Hussein? Imam Sadiq says, every time I see you, Mu'mineen, screaming for Hussein, shouting for Hussein, do you know what Imam Sadiq used to do? He used to go into sajda. He used to go into sajda and he used to do this dua. Allahum irham. Allahum irham tilka ladi sarkhatalana. Oh Allah, have mercy on those people who scream for us in our Masai. I think you are not happy with us. Have we cried for Hussein enough? Inshallah, you're happy with us. 
Inshallah, these tears will be given back to us on the day of judgment. Inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa ala ibadillah salihin. Allahumma ajjil valiyik al faraj. Ajjil valiyik al faraj. Ajjil valiyik al faraj. Wa rafiyat wa nas. Wa ja'alna min abanihi wa ansarihi wa shi'atuhu wa khadimihi. Assalamu alaikum wa ala ibadillah salihin. Assalamu alaikum. Thank <laughs> you.